Hello and welcome to another complete Cambridge IGCSE PE lesson, the second topic in Chapter 11, Blood Doping. As always, we'll cover absolutely everything you need to know for your exam, and today you need to be able to define the term blood doping and describe how it's carried out, and explain the effects and potential side effects of blood doping techniques. Blood doping, our key term for the lesson, is defined by the World Anti-Doping Agency, or WADA, as the misuse of techniques and or substances to increase a performer's red blood cell count. There are two ways in which this can be achieved, and the first is through injecting the banned substance erythropoietin, or EPO. EPO is actually a naturally occurring hormone that's released by the kidneys and stimulates the production of red blood cells in the bone marrow. The amount of EPO that we're able to produce ourselves is limited, however, meaning some athletes inject additional, artificially produced EPO to further increase their red blood cell concentration. Due to advancements in drug testing, the presence of EPO can now be detected, leading many athletes to use a more complicated and time-consuming alternative, blood transfusions. Step 1. Blood is taken from the athlete around 3 to 4 weeks before competition, preferably at a point when haemoglobin levels are at their highest. Remember, haemoglobin is the molecule found in red blood cells responsible for transporting oxygen. Step 2. The blood is frozen to maintain these high haemoglobin levels and prevent the cells from dying. Step 3. The body naturally begins to replace the extracted blood, returning the performer's red blood cell count to normal levels. Step 4. One or two days before competition, the frozen blood is thawed and reintroduced to the performer via a blood transfusion. Having taken on this additional blood, the performer now has a higher red blood cell concentration, allowing them to carry more oxygen than they could before the transfusion. So why do some athletes choose to use these banned techniques despite the risks to their health, reputation and career? Well, we've just established that blood doping serves to increase an athlete's oxygen carrying capacity by raising red blood cell and haemoglobin levels. This means that during competition, more oxygen is transported to the working muscles, leading to an increased rate of aerobic energy production. This is of course beneficial to endurance athletes, including cross-country skiers, triathletes, marathon runners and road cyclists, as it allows them to work at higher intensities for longer periods of time. In addition to improving one's aerobic fitness, doping may also speed up recovery times, as the extra oxygen carried by the blood accelerates the breakdown of lactic acid, helping athletes to pay back their oxygen debt more quickly. Lance Armstrong, the most successful cyclist of all time, was involved in perhaps the most famous blood doping case to date. In 2013, he finally admitted to using a combination of testosterone, anabolic steroids, EPO injections and blood transfusions, which were often self-administered in hotel rooms or in the back of the team's support van. He was subsequently stripped of each of his seven Tour de France titles. So what about the potential side effects or health risks of blood doping? Well, as red blood cell concentration increases in response to both EPO injections and blood transfusions, the blood becomes thicker or more viscous, meaning the heart needs to work harder to pump the blood around the body. This of course increases the risk of heart failure, but strokes and pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot on the lung, are also not uncommon. In addition, when using transfusions, blood bags may occasionally be mixed up if a doping doctor is handling bags from multiple athletes, which could lead to infection or the athlete's body rejecting the foreign blood. Finally, athletes may suffer from kidney damage if they use EPO excessively. Well done, you've just covered everything you need to know on topic 11.2, blood doping. If you'd like to practice applying what you've learned, you can find a link to every Cambridge Pass paper down in the description. As always, I hope you found this lesson useful, and I'll see you in the next one.